and welcome to this discussion about COVID-19. We are now five weeks on from the WHO declaring a global pandemic. And in the next 90 minutes, we are going to be bringing together experts from around the world to discuss where we are now and what should happen next. And they will also be able to answer your questions. And I'll be explaining in just a moment how you can send those in from wherever in the world you are watching and listening to this event. My name is Michelle Hussein and I'll be moderating the discussion. It takes place as part of Qatar Foundation's Education City Speaker Series, which is a platform for dialogue, bringing together key leaders on big global issues with members of the public given a chance to interact with them and put questions. And the discussion is also conducted in collaboration with WISH, which is Qatar Foundation's global health initiative, connecting healthcare leaders, practitioners, and also innovators. Before I introduce our seven contributors, our seven experts, you do have the opportunity to follow this discussion in uh, by using subtitles in English and also in other languages, Arabic, French, Italian and Chinese. Should you wish to do that, you can go to the settings icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen and you can choose your language there and the option for subtitles on your screen. Also in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you will see the ask a question blue icon and that is where uh, you will be able to put your contribution, your comment, your question to the contributors at any part in the discussion and I will come to those in due course and ask the contributors to answer them. Just one word on the questions, please do put your question through in English because that is the conversation that um, is common to all the speakers. So let me now introduce them to you. Delighted to be uh, joined by Dr. Ahmed Al Mandari, who is the WHO's Regional Director for the Eastern Mediterranean, a region which covers uh, from Morocco to Pakistan and including the GCC countries. Welcome, Dr. Al Mandari. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. And also with us is another WHO Regional Director, Dr. Matsushi Diso Moeti who looks after the region of Africa, 47 countries in all, and a warm welcome to you as well, Dr. Moetti. Thank you, thank you very much, pleased to be here. Joining us from Geneva is Dr. David Nabarro, the WHO's Special Envoy on COVID-19. He has been a familiar figure on the airwaves over the last few months, and he carried out a similar envoy role for the UN during the Ebola outbreak in 2014. Thanks for taking the time, Dr. Nabarro, to be with us. Thank you very much indeed. Good day, everybody. Joining us from Doha is Dr. Saleh al Mari, who is the Assistant Minister for Health Affairs at Qatar's Ministry of Public Health. His brief includes emergency preparedness and response. Hello to you, Dr. al Mari. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon to all. Alaikum salam. And with us from Milan is Rosella Michio, president of the NGO Emergency, which has provided free healthcare to millions of people in fragile countries since it was founded in 1994. She joins us uh, from Italy, where the organization is running clinics and is setting up a field hospital in Bergamo. Welcome, Rosella. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Jerome Kim is with us from South Korea, Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. Its work on COVID-19 includes developing an evaluation platform for multiple vaccine development groups. And clearly there is a lot um, that we all need to know and look forward to learning about your work. Dr. Kim, welcome. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon. And with us from Taipei is Dr. Siu Hung Wang, president of the Taiwan Nurses Association, which has nearly 70,000 members. And she is also a professor at Kaohsiung Medical University. Welcome to you as well, Dr. Wang. I think you'll need to unmute your microphone for us, Dr. Wang, but I can see you're with us. Uh, so that is that is great. We will come to you in a moment. So this event is going to be a mixture of discussion between the speakers, my questions, and also your questions, which are already coming in uh, from around the world. Remember to use that ask a question button to contribute your thoughts. Let me turn first to a couple of regional perspectives. So Dr. Al-Mandari, from your position as director 
for the Eastern Mediterranean. Assess the impact of the virus today on the region. What are you seeing? What are you concerned about? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you, colleagues. It is my great pleasure and honor to be in this uh, platform. And thank you very much for giving me the chance to join this uh, important discussion. Uh, as you all know, the I mean, uh, Eastern Mediterranean region is composed of 22 countries. Um, uh, these countries are have a variety, you know, at uh, different levels of, of uh, strength uh, when it comes into the healthcare system. Uh, from the first uh, moment, uh, WHO, uh, you know, made aware about the outbreak of this disease in China end of uh, last year. Uh, it has moved into all directions and the regional office in, in close collaboration with the headquarters uh, and uh, country offices with uh, close collaboration as well with the health authorities in each individual member state have been preparing ourselves for this sort of uh, outbreak. Uh, this, uh, you know, preparation have been strengthened and um, went uh, in, in a more stronger manner, particularly after the announcement of uh, Dr. Tedros about, uh, you know, this disease to become, I mean, as, as a, a pandemic uh, in uh, second week of March. Um, currently, uh, you know, 22 of the 22 countries we have have reported uh, cases that vary from one case to uh, thousands of cases. Uh, a number of them have also reported deaths. Um, we are working very closely with the healthcare authorities in each individual country. Uh, to um, look at what uh, possible ways, you know, to uh, make sure that whatever uh, outbreaks happening, uh, either, you know, individual cases or small clusters or multiple clusters or community transmission is uh, controlled and, and contained through different measures that have been recommended by WHO. Thank you, Dr. Almanir. Uh, Dr. Moeti, can I turn to you for a similar perspective from your vantage point across those 47 African countries? Uh, where is your greatest concern at this point in time? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Our greatest concern, in fact, is that uh, the virus has spread to virtually the entire region. So only two small countries out of the 47 have not yet reported confirmed cases and regrettably those tiny countries actually at the moment do not have uh, testing capacities. We're working very hard with the governments to avail them of uh, the necessary uh, equipments and uh, test kits but they do not have cases yet. Uh, in addition, we have a number of countries, about nine countries where we have geographic spread beyond the capital cities where these cases first came in, were imported mainly from European countries. And we also have a rapid increase in numbers in countries recently like Niger and, uh, and Chad. So we have a number, quite a large number of countries where the virus has spread beyond even the existing testing capacity in our countries. Because if I may speak to the question of testing, at the beginning of the outbreak early in February, only two countries have the capacity to detect this virus in, in our region. We've worked very hard with governments. Now we have uh, virtually all the countries except the two, but this testing capacity is concentrated in the capital cities. So there is a great need to expand beyond the capital cities, not only as far as testing capacity is concerned, but also the other public health actions, the surveillance, contact tracing, uh, isolation capacity and of course to prepare very much for case management. In the case of these countries, they're already having to manage patients. So a second huge concern is the weakness of our healthcare systems and therefore the capacity to provide ap appropriate care and management of the cases. We're very concerned about this. And then thirdly, uh, a big concern is the shortage of critical supplies that these countries need to carry out their, their response to this outbreak in terms of uh, equipment, uh, um, personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. We know that we have the weakest health systems if we look at certain indices um, globally in the African region, the largest number of countries with challenges in their health systems. So these are some of the concerns uh, that we have. And then finally, if I may add that uh, the governments are doing a lot of work informing the public about what they need to do to protect themselves. But 
hand washing is a challenge in some of our settings where people simply do not have access to running water at home. So these are some of the areas, some moving beyond the health system that really need strong intervention at the level of governments with our support. Thank you very much. Very useful to have those two snapshots of, of your regions. Let me turn then to the global overview from you, Dr. David Nabarro, with your role as the WHO Special Envoy on COVID-19. You have been immersed in this now for, for months. At this point in time, what are the key challenges on the virus and to the WHO's capacity, um, especially given the US President's comments in the last 24 hours about funding? Thank you very much indeed. First of all, I'd like to really acknowledge and respect the important roles being played by the regional directors in the Eastern Mediterranean region and also the regional director for Africa. And uh, I was listening just now to Dr. Tedros, the director general, when he was saying very clearly that his big concern is the way the virus is advancing in poor countries and communities all over the world, causing massive headaches, not only because of the disease itself, but also because of the impact of containment measures that are now being practiced to ensure physical distancing, affecting more than half the world's populations. It's a very difficult challenge for all governments. How can you ensure that people are not getting poorer as a result of containment, whilst at the same time ensure that there is not widespread suffering and death as a result of the virus? What Dr. Tedros is saying is that there is just one basic necessity everywhere, which is we take this virus seriously and that we detect cases, isolate them, treat them, trace their contacts, quarantine them and protect those who are most vulnerable. And we have to have that capacity in every society all over the world because this virus is not going to go away. It's a thoroughly dangerous virus. We're learning about it all the time. So what are the challenges? As we've heard, it is poor countries and poor communities. I have to keep stressing that. They're not able to do widespread virus testing. They're not able to protect their health workers because there's a shortage of protective equipment. They're not able to hospitalize all their cases. And at the same time, they're really suffering because now there's an increase in numbers of people who are short of food. And with Ramadan just a few days away, this is a real hardship for so many people in so many places. So how are we going to deal with this? Number one, we've all got to get very, very clear on what elements need to be in place to emerge from lockdown and not be faced by huge increases in numbers of cases. Number two, what's happening in the rich countries really matters because if they've got large amounts of virus, it gets exported to the rest of the world and it therefore becomes a source of stress for other countries. They can't go on closing their borders and yet at the same time restart their economies. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, global cooperation. This is a global pandemic. We mustn't spend too much time looking backwards. That can be done later when the history is written. Right now, we have to work together in solidarity at community level, at inside countries and between countries. Without solidarity, we won't win. Now, there are one or two countries that seem to be quite concerned about actions that were taken early on in the pandemic. This always happens. I was involved in this kind of concern when I was doing Ebola and I was also involved in that in influenza pandemics before. We say to everybody, we plead with everybody, look forward, focus on the epic struggle right now and leave the recriminations till later. And if in the process you decide you want to declare that you're going to withdraw funding or make other command comments about the WHO, remember that this is not just the WHO. This is the whole public health community that is involved right now. And you know, every single person in the world is a public health worker now. Everybody is taking responsibility. Everybody is sacrificing. Everybody is involved. And so it's public health leadership by the leaders you have on this call, Dr. Alan Sahansari and Dr. Moeti. That's the kind of leadership that needs to be supported. So we say to global leaders, looking them straight in the eye, 
The future of our world is in your hands. You must work together. You will not be forgiven if you don't. And so with those words, I hand back to you and I look forward, by the way, Dr. Tedros has told everybody that he is going to speak to the world about this at five o'clock European time this evening. And so I'd like him to be the one who deals with the specific point you raised. Thank you, Dr. Nabara. We have some questions coming in around the world and I will put some of them to you in just a moment. But before I go to our next contributor, I just want to mention that to anyone who wants to uh, follow this discussion with Arabic uh, subtitles, if you go to the bottom right hand corner of your screen under the uh, settings icon, you should be able to find the option to um, to to use subtitles in other languages. Indeed, you can use them in English, but also in Arabic, in Italian, in French and in Chinese. So if you would like to do that, please use the opportunity. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Saleh Almari, the Qatari Assistant Minister for Health Affairs. Bring us up to date, Dr. Almari, on the experience in Qatar. Uh, how many infections have you seen? How have you responded? Well, um, as of today, we had actually, we have 3,428 cases. But again, it's really worth mentioning that it, we are actually having and receiving very promising outcomes. That includes a very good recovery percentage, and more important, zero mortality within the past 48 hours. Under the very strong governance, governance structure to work together to flatten the curve, we are actually working with our local stakeholders and a very strong leadership under the WHO and as well as the international institutions. So working together is really uh, the, the, the key for success. And more important is really our community that can always adhere to all the measures that are being taken uh, in place. So we need actually to not to say that the, our uh, heroes are only the front li liners, including the healthcare workers, but I would say that our superheroes are those within the community as individuals, as families, whenever they abide with hand washing, uh, social distancing, wearing masks, masks and so on. So these are really as part of the, the thing that actually we pay attention to because again, it's really global collaboration, global health and more important is really realignment of our community and whatever the healthcare workers and other stakeholder, stakeholders are doing together. Thank you, Dr. Almari. Well, I want to turn now to Rosella Micho from the aid organization Emergency. Now, your work, uh, Rosella, takes place around the world, often in very vulnerable and fragile countries, and yet you have found yourself running clinics and a field hospital uh, in Italy during this time. Tell us about that experience and what it has been like. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, Italy has been the first European country that has been hit by this uh, tsunami uh, at the end of February. So uh, we were, of course, very much concerned worldwide because uh, we work in several countries that have a lot of links with China. So we immediately tried to put in place measures to strengthen the IPC uh, uh, control in, in, in the hospitals uh, like in Sudan, Afghanistan, Sierra Leone. But uh, at the same time, we tried to understand how we could be uh, helpful in Italy as well, starting from the most vulnerable groups, because what we realized immediately uh, was that um, in a situation where, uh, uh, rightly so, uh, the government is telling to people to stay home, it's very difficult when you don't have a home because you are homeless. Or if you have to call a doctor when you have symptoms, but you don't have a doctor because you are a vulnerable um, person, uh, we tended to focus on supporting these people. So we started to develop uh, um, surveillance measures for shelters in Milan, particularly for uh, migrants, asylum seekers, unaccompanied minors, uh, um, homeless people. And we're talking about 3,000 people, more or less, only in Milan city itself. 
uh, then we tend we try to support those who are staying home so the elderly people and through a network of volunteers we've been delivering uh, groceries drugs uh, primary goods to these people in order to make sure that they could stay safely home. Uh, and then at uh, um, a month later, let's say mid-March, we were, uh, um, let's say, also surprised uh, to be requested to intervene supporting the health system of the region, particularly in Bergamo, where we were requested by the regional authority and the civil protection to contribute to the establishment of a field hospital that was uh, set up in two weeks time so it was really a huge effort and uh, it's now running since uh, 10 days more or less and our team uh, is in charge of uh, the intensive care beds uh, within the, the facility which was uh, one of the major problems that our developed uh, strong health system had to face since the beginning. Thank you so much I can imagine it must be such a shock to see an advanced healthcare system like Italy so badly affected when so much of your experience is in um, countries with, with very different numbers of, of resources. Uh, let me turn then to Dr. Wang in Taipei from the perspective of the Taiwan Nurses Association. Of course, in, in Taiwan, if I can ask you first, Dr. Wang, to give the overview, Taiwan had a much better experience than Italy's in its ability to combat the virus. What made the difference in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michel. Um, after SARS, Taiwan government immediately put in place a preparedness plan for infection control and raised public awareness and promoted active epidemic response policies. And Taiwan government responded quickly to the COVID-19 threat and set up an expert response team as early as uh, January 2nd. On January 15th, COVID-19 was classified as a notifiable infectious disease. And on January 20th, the Center, Central Epidemic Command Center was established to cope with the pandemic. Thereafter, clear policies and uh, transparent information on issues such as border controls, quarantine policy, mask policy, and social distancing rules have been announced and updated in the course of daily press conferences. In terms of healthcare workers, infection control is officially part of regular government mandated hospital accreditation procedure and all healthcare workers in medical institutions and long-term care facilities are required to participate in a formal infection control training program annually. And we understand the frontline healthcare workers in some countries are at high risk condition due to the lack of adequate PPE. Taiwan Nurses Association is one of the members of International Council of Nurses, ICN. And the ICN first announced the need to secure the PPE supply chain at the beginning of this year and has continuously stood up for nurses and health workers to secure their rights to safety in delivering services to patients with COVID-19. In Taiwan, medical institutions provide appropriate PPE and training and allocate sufficient staffing numbers to assure safety for both nurses and patients. Thank you. It's my sharing. Thank you, Dr. Wang. We, we have a question that's come in about the availability of PPE for nurses, which I will come to in a moment. But before that, I want to, talk to turn to Dr. Jerome uh, Kim from the International Vaccine Institute, joining us from, from South Korea, because, of course, this is the news that everyone wants to hear about. How close are we to, to a vaccine? Can you bring us up to date on the likely time frame and how many candidate vaccines you think we'll have? 
So that's a it's a question that we've been asked many, many times uh, over the past several weeks. And, you know, under normal circumstances, we would normally we would say five to 10 years. And the average cost for a vaccine development is a billion dollars. Under the not normal circumstances, circumstances of the COVID pandemic, um, I think that we are looking at accelerating the um, development of, of vaccines to 12 to 18 months. And that's 12 to 18 months till the proof of concept, that is to the proof that a, a, one of the vaccines or maybe several of the vaccines actually protects against infection and disease. But it doesn't actually take into account yet the time it will take for a national regulatory authority, say the EMA or the FDA, to review the dossier and approve the vaccine. It doesn't take into account the time it will take a, um, a, rec a body that recommends vaccines for use, such as the ACIP or the WHO SAGE, to actually put a recommendation forward for use of the vaccine. And it really doesn't address the question of when we'll start manufacturing the vaccine so that after approval, so with a with a standard vaccine, as a company is doing phase three, they're actually starting to ramp up the ability to produce the vaccine so that when it's approved and recommended, vaccine can be sold or marketed. Under the circumstances of this pandemic, as we're working with relatively small companies, um, how are we going to make sure that we have vaccine available when it's approved? And how are we, how are we going to make sure that, that the timing of that availability uh, coincides with, uh, with the approvals that are, that are given the recommendations for use? So that's another question that we will have to wrestle with. And then there's a question of access. Now, who's going to get the vaccine first? And these are questions I think that we need to address now. We have to think about them because if we think about them only when the time comes for the vaccine to be used, we are not going to be able to find agreement. So we really need to prioritize groups that need to be vaccinated, countries or regions where need is greatest, and, and the world has to come to a decision about how to allocate the first uh, batches of vaccine. Hopefully, when we're looking now at you know, billions of doses of vaccine being required, we're going to probably have to have a lot of manufacturers. So right now we're looking at a portfolio of vaccines and, and many are, are very, very early and, and some have finally entered, or not finally, actually in a very expedited manner, entered human clinical trials. Um, you know, if we have several vaccines that make it to what we call phase three or efficacy trials, that would be a great thing. And if we have several that that show um, safety and efficacy in those phase three trials, um, you know, I think that we'll have achieved what many of people uh, thought was diff would be impossible, which is to get vaccines out in 12 to 18 months. One specific point, uh, Dr. Kim, is it the right approach to start manufacturing a vaccine before you get to the point that it has been uh, approved and before it's fully through the, uh, the process because in order to, to save time? So it's, it's actually somewhat difficult to do that because you don't know that the vaccine is actually going to work. But under normal circumstances, again, if you're a, a big company, say a Sanofi or a Pfizer, you have a vaccine in phase three, you're already fairly certain that it's going to work. And so what you're doing is you're trying to be sure that you're not going to waste any time bringing that vaccine to market. So you're preparing the manufacturing, sometimes the manufacturing plant as the phase three trial is going on. And although that um, you know, brings on some risk, given the fact that the vaccine is already in advanced stage of testing, um, a lot of the risk is mitigated. And the benefit from that is that um, people will start to benefit from the vaccine immediately uh, once we know that it works. The part of it that we don't know um, right now with, with CEPI and the other organizations funding vaccine research is how we're going to handle this if there are multiple vaccines uh, that are entering phase three trials. And if one or two or three of them work, how are we going to prioritize uh, what's manufactured? Where will it be manufactured? And how will decisions be made to ensure that populations everywhere in the world have access to the vaccine? Thank you so much. I'm going to turn now to the questions because there are lots of questions coming in to us from different parts of the world. Just a reminder, if you want to ask one, uh, the blue ask a question button towards the bottom right hand corner of the screen is how to do it. I'm going to begin by asking Dr. David Nabarro to pick up on this point of how we emerge from lockdowns because 
lockdowns or different restrictions have become a way of life for the last few weeks in many countries. So Robbie in the UK, Dr. Nabar, wants um, to know, the governor of California said yesterday that in his state there should be no large gatherings before a vaccine is available, which is likely to be next year. Is that the right approach? When should the world plan on holding social events again? Thank you very much indeed, Michelle. You see, every government right now is having to make some really tough choices. So let's start with some of the things that we definitely know. This virus isn't going to go away in the foreseeable future. This virus is highly transmissible. This virus can be transmitted by people who don't know that they're very ill. So every single community in every part of the world has got to get used to living with COVID virus. And that capacity to be able to find people who've got the disease and to isolate them and to get them properly looked after by health services that are well equipped with nurses like we heard from Dr. Wang in, in Taipei. This is the absolute bedrock of what, what, what we've got to do. And that make, means that we have to be on the defensive. But being on the defensive makes us strong. Being on the defensive enables us to live with the virus. It's a bit like what happened in 1854 when it was discovered that uh, contaminated water was the source of cholera. We had to develop a whole new way of living, including modern sanitation, in order to stay healthy. Well, now we'll have to get, develop a whole new way of living to be able to coexist with this virus. And yes, it will mean changes to the way in which we socialize, to the way in which we work. And we won't be able to go straight away back to the world as we knew it a few months ago. But I have great belief in the ingenuity of humanity, and we will find ways to do this. We will learn more about the virus and how it behaves. We will learn how we can keep safe. And that means that we will, over time, be able to go back to the new normal. I can't say how long it will take, and I know that as countries come out of lockdown, they'll have to be prepared sometimes to go into partial lockdowns in certain areas because the virus will come back. You can't stop it. You can't just put a wall around your country and say, everybody, only if you've not got the virus can you come in, because it's too difficult to do that. People will come in. And that's the necessity for the future, is a constant state of readiness, alertness, and capacity to respond with much greater respect for and investment in public health services everywhere. And lastly, it's up to us. It's up to every single one of us to be able to live responsibly, whether we're at work, whether we're socializing, whether we're in the community, whether with our families, whether we're in the mosque, wherever we are, we're gonna to have to be able to organize our lives with the threat of this virus until, as Dr. Kim says, we'll have one or more vaccines but we mustn't anticipate that's going to be any time soon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nabara. Dr. Al-Mandari, just one point about how we emerge from this in terms of timing, because Ramadan is coming and that's a moment of particular relevance across your region. Is that going to present particular challenges, a time of year when people ideally in normal times would like to gather with friends, family in the evening, would like to be going to the mosque? Uh, thank you, thank you for this important question. And uh, in fact, it is, you know, a, a challenge, a real challenge that we are going to face in few, I mean, two weeks time. Uh, but the WHO uh, regional office headquarters have been working with uh, other groups, the Islamic Advisory Group and uh, the OIC, uh, in order to come out with a very sort of uh, scientific, uh, evidence-based uh, recommendation linked with uh, religious sort of uh, scholars' recommendation in order to guide our communities, especially at uh, you know the holy month of Ramadan, in which we used to have a lot of gatherings, either during the prayers or during the breaking the fast. And uh, as mentioned by um, you know uh, Dr. Naparo, we have to you know take these public health measures. It, it has been proven in many countries that it will definitely help us in controlling uh, the the disease, uh, you know, spread and outbreaks uh, to the communities, and it will help us in saving lives as well. 
So um, we are working with um, colleagues in, in different uh, organizations in, in, in either Muslim countries or all Muslim organizations around the globe to make a very clear advice to all Muslims around the globe. Thank you, Dr. Almandari. Dr. Moeti, I want to pick up with you on this point that Dr. Kim made about eventually when we have a, a vaccine, how it is distributed, where it is distributed. You already um, made the point about the uh, shortage of critical supplies in your region. Uh, you are the WHO director for Africa, the lack of testing capacity. The same could well happen with the availability of the vaccine for Africa. Yes, uh, we we very much hope and uh, expect from previous experience that the sort of global solidarity that has been in place to enable African countries to have access to vaccines, including some of the new vaccines uh, that are being made available to the poorest countries, will prevail in, in the context of this um, of this COVID-19 vaccine. We know, for example, that organizations like uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, have been involved in financing access to vaccines in the past, including uh, the Ebola vaccine that was developed under quite similar circumstances to what is happening now, being tested in the field while also being used to have an impact on the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it's very much our hope that we will see this. We are working very hard with um, African countries to help them as well to make the decisions to invest in uh, their health systems and also to invest in their capacity to deliver vaccine. So I would hope very strongly that these principles will prevail in this very uh, acute moment for the whole world. Dr. Kim, you wanted to come back on that? Yes, actually, I actually had a question for Dr. Navarro, if I may. Um, and it's, it's a question that we've been asked several times, and it would be great to have his expert opinion on this. Um, the question is when we trigger um, releasing some of the social restrictions. Um, you know, is it a period of time, say 14 days or 21 days or, or you know, a month of decreasing death, the turning the corner on deaths, decreasing uh, rates of new infections, or is it a threshold of new infections that countries or cities or, or um, states should use as the trigger for um, planning the release? Do you have any thoughts on that? Michelle, may I answer? Please do, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was talking with colleagues in the, in the WHO headquarters about this just yesterday. And, and there are really two sides to it. Number, uh, number one is how public health is getting ready. And number two is whether society is able also to cope with the new normal. So public health service is getting ready. The kind of indicators that Dr. Kim mentioned are really going to be very important. Knowing how transmission is going, knowing what the pattern of the epidemic curve is like, knowing whether or not there are lots of new infections, quite difficult to do if you haven't got testing. And linked to that, this capacity very quickly to close down new outbreaks when they occur. That reinforcement of public health is so important. It's like a defense system. And then there's the other side, what's happening in society? How much pain is there and suffering as a result of the sacrifice people are having to make in order to cope with the social and physical distancing that's being called for? I see every government trying to weigh this up, but I've listened to Dr Tedros very carefully. He's imploring countries to recognise that if they release their lockdowns too quickly, there is a real possibility of huge outbreaks developing super fast, like what we've seen in the Europe and the US. And he really does not want that to be happening in poorer nations at this time. He fears that there will be huge, huge consequences in terms of suffering and indeed of death from other conditions that people suffer that won't be able to be treated because everybody's so preoccupied with dealing with the virus. What that leads me to conclude, Dr. Kim, is possibly the most important thing is the reinforcement and strengthening of local public health capacity in all communities to be able to find people with disease very quickly. Exactly what was happened in, has happened in East Asia following SARS. They knew because SARS had given them 
but the signs of what needs to be in place to do it. And that's why so many countries in East Asia, including the country where you are, seem to be doing remarkably well. They're still having scares, but they're being able to respond super quickly. So we need to follow your model. We need to follow the Korean approach. Thank you. It, it does depend on getting the capacity up to test, which has been a particular issue in so many countries. I can see that lots of the people are asking about the possibility of reinfection um, taking hold as uh, lockdowns are lifted. I, I want to turn uh, to uh, Rosella Michio. Uh, Rosella, from your perspective of what you've seen in Italy, Dr. Nabar is talking about the new normal that we are going to live with. Do you think that people I'm imagining people are both fearful of the virus and also, of course, the restrictions are difficult as well. Uh, how, how worried are people in Italy about what might happen once, once, we, once they emerge from lockdown? Well, this is one of the big discussions going on around Italy now, uh, also because we have a regional system, so uh, each region is trying to uh, put uh, its own uh, opinion into the, into the discussion. But I really think that uh, in this particular situation, a centralized uh, uh, decision-making process is what we really need. Uh, because also if you take into consideration what has happened in Italy and how differently uh, regions have been impacted, um, you, you can see really that uh, we really need one very clear uh, message uh, that has to be given. And I think that people um, are willing to, um, to respect and to follow what uh, what is uh, what is requested by the authorities because uh, we 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 could not expect uh, what happened here i mean we have uh, health workers we have uh, ordinary people that are really um uh, destroyed by the sufferings that they've seen in the past uh, uh, two months. So nobody wants to go back to that. Uh, I'm sure that most of the people will accept a longer, um, um, a longer, uh, let's say, um, limitation to the ordinary lives, uh, to the ordinary lives. So um, I think that uh, uh, it's uh, it's um, that also the differences between the European countries can create problems because uh, uh, if, if information and messages and policies are not clear, people get confused. And if people get confused, then uh, um, the differences between the different social groups uh, can uh, can become bigger. The gaps can can become uh, deeper, and uh, and it's going to be more and more difficult to to go back to a new normality. So this is why it's very important to keep everybody in in the loop to take into consideration that a community is made of every single individual and that uh, we really should um, follow as much as possible the uh, messages and the indications that are given at international and national uh, level. Okay, I, I want to turn to Dr. Almari and then to Dr. Wang before I come back to Dr. Nabarro because we only have a, a few minutes uh, more with him before he has to leave us. Uh, Dr. Almari, in, um, from the Qatari perspective as the Assistant Minister for Health Affairs, on this point Rosella made about messaging, what has been the hardest message to get across in Qatar about this? First of all, I would like actually to echo what has been said regarding the public health strengthening. I'm really in line with this. But again, we need actually to expand on the acute and intensive care services, knowing that we have lots of hospital-based and hospital-acquired uh, or needs, actually, when it comes into beds and so on. So I think we need actually to, yes, to strengthen, but also to explore the expansion and also to be ready for the worst scenario. With the, um, the messaging, knowing that this pandemic is something new, it's new to everyone, young and old, men and women. So despite the active engagement, using different uh, channels well and also the challenges knowing that Qatar is really has the diversity of culture knowing that we have almost more or equal to 87 nationalities 
it's really making it difficult to us to get the maximum of our uh, public complaints um, and especially to the public measures. But always we believe in our resources when it comes into our communication team. And this means it's not really health, but also at the nationwide. They have really made lots of innovative and tremendous efforts. In addition, and this is really a very clear message to everybody. I should say that, and I'm really 100% sure that we here in Qatar, we trust our community, honestly, to adhere. Yes, we are hearing different voices, but really looking at the majority, I think we are really hearing that everyone is really abiding with all measures. Yes, there is a challenge when it comes into approaching Ramadan. Yes, there are actually many of psychological impact on people being staying at home and doing things that are not really usually do. So, um, but we have actually took a step ahead, creating a platform, uh, supporting people with psychological uh, issues, and also up approaching our scholars, the Islamic or the Muslim scholars early on and sitting with the minister of Awqaf or the Islamic affairs, sharing all of the, the our um, beliefs, our measures, and they are really understanding the situation and they are really very supportive and also very innovative in different ways. It's not only really mosques, but also breaking fast, giving foods, charity. So lots of things, socializing, mass gathering. I hope that the way that we are really doing it and making people ready for receiving Ramadan with a different mindset and also lots of innovative methods and different ways to live Ramadan. Maybe yes. it's really an opportunity to do it differently, sitting with families, doing lots of things that we are not really doing yes. during the past years. Thank you, Dr. Almari. I want to turn to Dr. Wang now because we've had a question in from a nurse in the Philippines called Romnik. There is a global shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE that can endanger health workers, especially nurses. How does the Taiwan Nurses Association provide assistance to nurses regarding the scarcity of PPE? Uh, as much as you know, we learned from SARS because of insufficient PPE, some healthcare workers died from that time. So listen from SARS, uh, the government has accumulated a pre stockpile of PPE, uh, like a pre a provide enough surgical mask for front healthcare workers to protect themselves. And uh, we have some like a um, ban on export of surgical mask from January 24. And I think uh, um, PPE including gun, goggle, uh, clothing, but surgical mask is very important right now. So we have a very good policy for for mask uh, export and uh, pro produce. And we, um, I think uh, right now we allocate a mask to every citizen through name based rationing system purchase because I think we have this uh, mask control to assure the uh, healthcare workers and the nurses have enough sufficient surgical mask to taking care of the you know, the patients. So um, in addition to increasing the mask production, the government has continued to prepare the stockpile of PPE, including isolation, uh, protective guns, and uh, N95 respirator for medical and public health care workers. Yes. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Wang. Uh, I want to turn back to Dr. David Nabarro now, WHO envoy, special envoy in COVID-19, because we have a few questions for you, um, Dr. Nabarro. Um, can you start with this one, which is about data? A couple of people have asked questions about why the recovery percentages are so low in some countries and so high in others. Now, 
We know some countries have tested more than others. But the question is, should WHO be doing more to encourage standardised metrics so a better comparison can be made? First of all, uh, yes, we, we totally understand that there are differences between countries and colleagues are exploring these all the time. And you're quite right that there are variations in testing, which means that the denominator, if colleagues know what that means, i.e. the bottom number when you're working out a rate, is very variable. Uh, most important thing that we're saying is that there is now a growing level of experience about the various strategies for treatment that are most likely to succeed. And wherever possible, we suggest that people do follow recognised clinical protocols rather than perhaps more experimental protocols. We think that they offer the best chance of success. And so the second thing is once again, and I want to keep stressing this, everything depends on the degree to which different authorities within countries and then authorities between countries uh, collaborate. We can't get standardization of measurement and approaches and then compare if there's not some degree of willingness to standardize and to work together. And so that's an extra, extra reason why I plead for in-country coordination like Rossella just mentioned and for between-country coordination like uh, Minister Al uh, Almari mentioned. It, without coordination, we can't get standardization of data. Without standardization of data, we don't know how the world is progressing. Uh, another question uh, we have here, this has come from Her Excellency Lolwal Khater in Qatar um, to you. In very simple steps, can you please describe the South Asian countries model that you just lauded? Thank you very much indeed. Step one, every single person in the country has to know what the issue is, has to understand what they have to do and has to be responsible and to be sure that they're part of a total community response. And we are hearing about this in this in this webinar. This is what's happening in many places, including in Qatar. Secondly, you must reinforce what we call public health. Now, that's not hospitals. That's the people who work at community level, who go around and find people who are ill and who make sure that they're isolating properly. Sometimes we suggest that in countries that don't have this, they set up neighborhood health watches where there are people in the community who are keeping an eye on the health of others particularly important in situations where there are homeless people or people who are itinerant. Number three, get your hospitals COVID ready. And of course that means, as we heard from Dr. Wang, having the masks, having the protective equipment, but also having the beds with the isolation units and the necessary ventilators and other treatment, because you never know when you're going to get a wave. And to make sure that capacity in there is absolutely crucial. Number four, have the whole of government, every single part of government, every one of the different political parties, if you've got a multi-party system, working together as a coalition, treating this as a national emergency, so that as and when it's necessary to shift policy quickly because there's a sudden outbreak occurring in a particular place, instead of aiming arguments about it, you just get to work, you work quickly, robustly and rapidly, and contain outbreaks when they happen. Then life can go on. Then the economy can restart. Then we can continue to socialize, albeit in a much more careful way, but we don't have to stick in this current state forever. I hope your excellency those points are, are reasonable. Uh, I'm very happy to follow up privately, if it could be helpful, with an email or se sending documents to you. But the South on Southeast Asian experience, sorry, is really, really important for all the rest of us to follow. Thank you for setting it out so clearly. I'm sure that will be appreciated, um, Dr. Nabara. Now, Dr. Moeti, there are a couple of questions that have come um, specifically either from your region or relating to your region in particular. So uh, here's one of them. There are many poor countries which do not have basic protective measures against COVID-19, no clean water, not enough health services. What are the appropriate measures they could use to safeguard their population as they can. Yes, I think that's the reality in, in many countries and many communities within countries that have uh, a range of uh, situations. Uh, for example, around access to water, 
we I've, I want to follow up very much on what David has said in terms of this being a multi-sectoral response. So it's not only the public health system that has to work. Those uh, sectors that are dealing with access to water, hygiene, have to be involved as well. And um, one of the things that African countries are doing with support from partners is to put in place public places, posts for hand washing around neighborhoods where people may struggle to have water in the home. And then of course, to distribute sanitizers so that people when they go home are able to clean their surfaces, are able to clean their hands and sanitize their hands regularly, etc. So these are some of the things that we are encouraging and we're in partnership with organizations like UNICEF who work on water and sanitation so that they cover those sectors that need to be to be enabled to to do some of these uh, some of these things it is very difficult in some circumstances to do uh, physical or social distancing because simply because of the of the types of dwellings people might be living in we are thinking about additional measures and we advise that where it might be helpful people might use homemade masks because also masks are difficult to get but it's our responsibility to make sure that we advise on how to do this safely, how to have a supply of masks that can be changed or discarded so that that does not in itself become a source of infection. So we are needing to uh, innovate. We are needing to adapt these public health measures to the context in which, in the sometimes very difficult context, in which they have to be carried out in some African settings. Thank you. I just want to come back to Dr. Nabarro because um, it, you're going to leave us now because you have another um, event to get to, Dr. Nabarro. Thanks so much for, for being with us. Any final thought from you before you go? Well, I have really enjoyed this webinar and listening to my colleagues as they set out different aspects of this. I've also really been, been inspired by some of the comments and questions coming through on the chat. So there it is. When cases arrive in a community, don't hold back. Don't imagine it can be you can wait. Respond rapidly, respond robustly, and then you will be able to contain this virus and hold it at bay. This is the new normal. We've all got to get used to it. We might as well get used to it now. And if we argue about it, we will get into trouble. The virus will find its way between us and will catch us out and we will be asking ourselves, why on earth didn't we move more quickly? Why on earth didn't we develop a unified strategic approach and implement it properly? We owe it not only to our people in our nations, but to the people of the world. We're one family. Thank you very much indeed, Shukrun, and I hope very much to be able to stay in contact. And I really feel in this particular group that I'm with a family. We are all one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. David Nabarro, WHO Special Envoy on COVID-19. Thank you so much for being with us. So lots of questions are continuing to come in from many different parts of the world. I'm going to try and use our remaining 30 minutes to get through as many of them as we can. So let me turn then to Dr. Ahmed Al Mandari, Regional Director for WHO for the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this is a question about what we can learn when all of this is over, even though perhaps we should think more in terms of a new normal rather than it being over. Uh, what would you say to this question, uh, Dr. Mandari, which comes from Nick Ross in the UK? Governments are criticised for unpreparedness and slow responses to COVID-19, but truly global plagues are rare. It has been a hundred years since the Spanish flu outbreak. What must we learn from COVID-19 so that even if nothing like this happens for another hundred years, the world is much better able to cope next time? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for this important question. And in fact, I just want to go back to what uh, David Nabarro mentioned. You know, we are going to face a new normal and by a new normal, this is uh, something that is uh, going to be faced by governments with its different sectors um, and also by communities and societies and, and members in these communities. For governments, you know, they have to uh, rebuild, reestablish, redevelop, rethink the way they are running healthcare systems. Uh, before uh, COVID-19 is totally different after COVID-19 when it comes into uh, healthcare systems in each country. Uh, you know, in, in, in the past few years, we have been thinking about, you know, having uh, big hospitals, uh, sophisticated hospitals, well equipped uh, with the latest machines and equipments and technologies. 
and forgetting almost, you know, almost in many, many countries. And uh, this is, I'm, 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 so, I'm sorry to say it, you know, about the basic health, uh, public health measures that have been there for many years and it saved us a lot of lives. So this is something that is a new lesson we are going to learn after COVID-19. Uh, at a community level, uh, you know, it is definitely going to change the habits and behaviors of the communities. Uh, a lot of um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, I, I cannot call it bad behaviors, but risky health behaviors that have been there in the past, it is going to change totally. Um, it is going to turn people more health conscious, more of uh, public health conscious, you know, when it comes into their own and their surroundings health. Uh, again, for, for governments as well, uh, it is going to bring all sectors within the government. It's going to bring all countries within the same region or even outside the region. It is going to bring all partners and, uh, and you know, uh, donors coming together, as David said, as one family to face. This is, you know, a new sort of uh, pandemic that never practiced or never experienced in the past, uh, uh, recent, you know, recent past. Yeah, uh, I, I want to turn to Dr. Murray. I'll come to you shortly, but I want to, talk to, to turn to Dr. Jerome Kim with a couple of um, questions. One person saying, after listening to all of the speakers, isn't it inevitable that everyone will be infected with COVID-19 sooner or later? Wonder what you think of that. And the other question is about the mutation or possible mutation of the virus. What is the effect that will have? Um, on the global and and is a global consortium of manufacturing platforms being considered instead of individual groups? So, um, all good questions. Um, so, to to take the mutation question first, um, because it's been the the source of many speculations um, recently. You know, over thirty over three thousand full length viruses have been sequenced around the world. I, I, we're probably headed towards ten thousand. Um, they haven't actually identified that many mutations. So in a, in a genome, which is, we could say, 30,000 base pairs of, of nucleic acid, there have been 11 mutations noted. Now, those 11 mutations allow you to break the virus into groups. And for instance, you know, they know that in San Francisco, there are multiple separate introductions of, of virus, probably from China. Um, additional groups have said that the introductions into, into New York were, again, multiple, um, but uh, through Europe. And so we can, we can tell by these little signatures where the viruses are coming from, but by and large, they're not all that different. In fact, the mutation rate for this virus appears to be um, one tenth the mutation rate for influenza. So that raises the possibility that this virus will you know, be relatively the same when we're getting ready uh, to do the vaccine testing. Um, or that's the hope. Uh, we don't know though that, that people who are infected uh, will not get infected again. And that's actually a critical thing to understand. There's some data from monkeys, from uh, monkey studies, that would suggest that once you're infected, um, once a monkey was infected, it could not be reinfected. We're hoping that that applies to humans. Uh, and that gets to the bigger question of, well, what if we just let the virus run rampant? So we've already seen what happens, you know, and we know pretty well the statistics actually are fairly similar in many countries, that 80% of people are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic, Another 15% of people uh, need to be hospitalized. 5% of them need to be ventilated. And when you're thinking about a country the size of the United States, 350 million people, or India with 1.1 billion people, and you look at those statistics, how are you going to hospitalize 15% of 350 million people in a short period of time? How are you gonna put all those people on ventilators? So even though the United States uh, had 12,700 ventilators in reserve. The estimate is that we would need to triple the number of ventilators in the United States in order to accommodate the surge from, uh, from COVID-19. So letting it you know, take its toll um, is, a, is an interesting thought and that's what it would have happened in the past. What we're doing with flattening the curve, actually one of the very important things is we're pushing, um, we're actually decompressing the healthcare system to allow access to healthcare to more people, access to appropriate healthcare to more people, and it gives us time to get all those other uh, pandemic preparations that Dr. Mbarro was talking about into place uh, in, a, in a realistic time frame so that we can be ready um, for the, you know, the eventual turning of the corner and, and, and release. The final thing is the global vaccine platform. 
And that would be a great idea if we knew what vaccine uh, was going to be the one that succeeds. So for now, we and then this is typical of a, what we call a portfolio uh, pipeline. You have a lot of candidates in animal studies. Fewer of them make it into phase one, which is the initial t phase of human testing, which, where we look at safety. Phase two is a much larger set, you know, two to 300 people, where we look in the target population to make sure the vaccine is doing what we think is are the right um, protective or immune responses. And then phase three, the final phase, actually often involves thousands of people. One trial that I did had 16,000 people in it. Um, and so, you know, as we as we move forward, there are going to be fewer and fewer candidates, but we want to be able to test different concepts because we don't really know uh, which one will ultimately be successful. Ultimately, maybe there will need to be a global platform and or we will have to transfer the ability to make vaccine from the company that originated it to multiple sites around the world where, where manufacturing can be scaled up um, significantly. And, and you know, many companies are already starting to do that, reaching out to companies that make hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine a year. And, um, and they're really starting to think, uh, how are we going to do this if our vaccine is successful? Very useful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jerome Kim. Uh, Dr. Sali Almari, I wonder if you want to say something about the work that Qatar is doing to support vaccine development. And I also want to put this question to you, which has come uh, from Qatar, from Sayed, who asks the following. Knowing there are many people uh, who are not reported in the cases, perhaps because they are asymptomatic, what do you think is the real rate of infection versus the numbers that are reported? Uh, first of all, um, let me go back to Kim, uh, Dr. Kim and also Dr. Mandari. Uh, for Dr. Kim, uh, we hope that we are going to have an uh, effective, uh, effective vaccine that can always be at some point of time and Qatar would be happy to participate in any international vaccine trials. And for uh, Dr. Mandari, uh, are we really missing investment on mitigation? Because I think we are always busy with our preparedness and response, but not really investing enough on mitigation, which is really an essential for uh, one step ahead of whatever can always come. And I think we need actually to think also for recovery. It's not always being busy with something while later on you are really stuck with something that we need actually to plan for. So we need actually to focus on the start and also why not really neg neglecting the, the end, which is again, it is really something that goes in cycle. For uh, Qatar, I think we, yes, it's, Qatar is like other countries. We have a percentage and it's really as per the WHO, we have almost 20% that can always end either in acute care or intensive care. And the 80%, the remaining 80% really divides between asymptomatic, mild, to moderate, and we are not really different. But I think we are really in a good position where we always manage all spectrum. Whenever there is someone who is really mild, moderate, we have different pathways, including those who are really tested positive, those who are really mild to moderate, and yet those who are really severe or acute. But more important, with this kind of statistics and data that really coming up, it's due to the level and the, um, the scale of screening and testing here in Qatar. At the point of entry, we screen and swap everybody. So that really gives you the extent of uh, effort that the Ministry of Public Health working with other uh, agencies to, to identify those who are really at, at high risk and also to find different pathways so that they can always be uh, quarantined, isolated, admitted, and so on. Yeah. So yes, we have this, but also I can always reassure that we, we have different pathways for different levels of infection. Thank you. And I will come to Dr. Al Mandari in a moment to both to put your question and another one that's come into us um, over the system. But Rosella Michio, I, I want to turn to you because there's a, a different question for you. Um, clearly, there's been an immense toll on healthcare workers from this global pandemic. 
But here's a question that's been put through for you. Do you recommend that any physician or professional staff not required for clinical duty at a hospital should be permitted to stay home to reduce chance of exposure and maintain physical distancing? And also, what is the psychological effect on the doctors and nurses that you've worked closely with in places like Bergamo? Well, I will start from the, the second part of the question because uh, uh, not only in Bergamo, but to here, generally speaking, in Lombardy, um, the psychological effect on the health worker has been very, very heavy. Um, the people have been seeing a tremendous amount of deaths. I mean, uh, we, we have had above uh, 20,000 people that because directly linked to, to coronavirus. And this is something which is really uh, abnormal. For, for our uh, healthcare system. And in addition to that, for the first time uh, in a developed uh, health system, such as the Italian one, um, healthcare workers had to uh, decide to triage, let's say, uh, people, uh, um, I mean, to decide who was uh, uh, to be admitted to intensive care uh, unit treatment and who was not. And this was uh, something very, very difficult. We are seeing it daily, unfortunately, in many countries of the world when, uh, where uh, uh, health systems are much weaker. But definitely in Italy, this was something uh, for which uh, uh, doctors and nurses were not, uh, were not really uh, prepared. Uh, then, of course, uh, everybody should, uh, should stay home as much as possible, of course. But at the same time, I think that with the due um, uh, protection and uh, by implementing proper IPC uh, measures, uh, everybody can be can be helpful. I mean, we are uh, um, training hundreds of volunteers, uh, for example, to deliver, as I was saying, like groceries or drugs to people that are staying home uh, since more than a month and none of them got infected. Why? Because they were doing it in a proper way, following the rules within a coordinated system. So, of course, uh, uh, everything can be done. Uh, but it has to be done in a proper way. And I also think that uh, we should start sharing best practices, not only in Italy, but perhaps worldwide. And I hope that this kind of platforms where we can share experiences from different countries uh, can become uh, really a new model of uh, uh, cooperation and of increasing solidarity worldwide because uh, it's a matter of resources physical, human, technological, but also uh, of practices. So sharing practices and best practices can be uh, an innovation very useful uh, for this new normal that we are all talking about. Thank you, Rosella. I'm going to turn to Dr. Almandari and Dr. Moeti. If I can come to Dr. Moeti first, uh, Faith Nawagi uh, has this question from Uganda. There are countries doing well in Africa as regards to handling this issue. How do we leverage the best practices these countries are doing for other African countries? Yes, um, we are, of course, among our WHO experts through our WHO country offices, we have a, a country team in every single single country in the region, we are sharing information with our representatives and their teams on some of the good things that we see happening so that they make the governments aware of this. We are planning to organize meetings, virtual meetings of groups of ministers of health and their technical experts to hear from them what challenges they are facing, but also exchange information with them. And we are working on putting in place a platform of, what, together with the UN, in fact, with the rest of the UN agencies, on uh, knowledge management, good practices, so that these can be availed to countries around the, around the region. One of the areas that we haven't talked about uh, very much, which really needs this, is um, mitigation of the impact of the lockdowns and limitations in movement of people, movement of goods, and the impact that is having on, on low-income people. We really do see that 
a small number of African countries for the moment are putting in place mitigations uh, targeting the very vulnerable section of the society. We, need, we are intending in WHO to circulate information on this and encourage other countries with the support of the international community, not only to invest in the public health response and ensuring that essential services are available, but to really look at how do you help um, people working in the informal sector who, if they can't leave the house every day to go and set up their market stall and earn their living, literally are not able to buy food for their families. It's possible to put in place these mitigation measures. They need to be planned about, and we see it very much as our responsibility to circulate information and encourage sooner rather than later countries that are putting in place such, such lockdown measures to adopt them from the very beginning. Thank you. And Dr. Al Mandari, in the region you look after, we had Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan saying yesterday that his country was trapped between the virus on one hand and hunger on the other hand. And there's a question here from Sarah Phillips in London asking how countries like Afghanistan are being supported. Yeah. <clears throat> in fact, I mean, this is one of the challenges, as you know, uh, here in Imru. Uh, two thirds of our countries have been suffering from uh, instabilities and emergencies, either natural or man-made. And uh, WHO have been working with all partners and in close collaboration with the authorities in these countries to make sure that uh, they are uh, well prepared, you know, for this uh, sort of pandemic. Um, we have been working with ministries of health. We have been working with donors. Uh, we have we have been working also with. Um, uh, different sectors in Afghanistan to make sure that they are well prepared in terms of identifying those um, positive cases at the points of injuries. And um, we have been working also with the Ministry of Health to make sure that those who have been identified as positive are isolated and their contacts uh, are traced and given uh, the right quarantine. Um, one of the challenges is, uh, you know, we are facing all now, not only in Imro, but in many other regions, is the lockdowns and uh, restriction of travels and closure of airports and cancellation of flights. Um, we have been trying, uh, you know, with certain countries here in the region to help us uh, send the charters to um, provide supplies to these countries like Afghanistan and uh, also to send uh, technical missions and experts to the countries. Um, we have been trying to be innovative when it comes into providing the technical advice through using the IT technologies, you know, having uh, groups on uh, regular contacts with their counterparts in the country offices as well in the ministries of health in Afghanistan. Thank you so much. Dr. Wang, I want to turn to you next, uh, Dr. Wang from the Taiwan Nurses Association, because we have a question from Tamer Shukri for you about how we should encourage an expansion in the numbers of medical workers, whether doctors, nurses or support staff over the next six to ten years. What, what do you think also the impact will be on the perception and appreciation of the profession of nursing? I think we have seen uh, the many warm and the spontaneous messages of thanks and the gratitude from the public broadcast on television stations across, and uh, across social media, I think uh, worldwide and uh, also in Taiwan. So this positive uh, social atmosphere may po positively you know, support all the uh, frontline healthcare workers, including uh, nurses and, uh, you know, physicians. And also, I think um, we have some, like, uh, we need to uh, provide them some, like, uh, hazard subsidy compensation to encourage their, like, um, you know, uh, caring in the front line for this uh, COVID-19 COVID patients and give them uh, maybe in the long run, we need to give them some like um, mental support, social support, especially a designed resilient program for them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jerome Kim from the International Vaccine Institute. Uh, this is actually a, a response to um, Deputy Minister Almari. 
Um, but I want to say I really support the idea that we need to expand training for nurses and, and thank them for everything they've done. My grandmother and mother were nurses, and um, I really believe that, that the nursing profession uh, has really shown itself well during this crisis. But for Dr. Omari, um, so we will be coming by to talk to you about um, participation in clinical trials for, for vaccine development. So don't worry about that. But the other part is, I think, a very important point that he made, which is, you know, the testing of these vaccines as we you know, get vaccines through phase one, phase two and into phase three. These need to be vaccines that we know will work around the world. So this isn't the vaccine for people in, in the United States, just the people in the United States or just the people in Korea or just the people. I mean, everyone has to participate in, in vaccine clinical trials. And, you know, I've done vaccine clinical trials and I can tell you that the volunteers in these clinical trials, even the volunteers in phase three trials, when you ask them why they're doing it, they say it's because, you know, they want to make a contribution. So, you know, we've all talked about how we need to work together. Well, vaccine um, experimental vaccine clinical trials are something that we all need to do. And, you know, people in the United States will, will volunteer, people in Europe will volunteer, people in Africa and Asia will volunteer because in the end we need a global vaccine, a vaccine that, that works for everybody. And, and I didn't mention this, but and, and they really deserve a lot of congratulation. And this is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, which is an, uh, a global organization uh, funded by a number of countries, including Japan, Norway, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, uh, and several organizations like the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. One of the things CEPI did was it got the world ready for the COVID-19 outbreak by setting up um, an ability to um, do the kinds of vaccines that are needed for outbreaks. And we've never done a good job at this before because you know an outbreak happens and then it disappears. And before we can actually get the vaccine out the door, the disease is gone and, and no company wants to be stuck with a vaccine that's not fully tested that it can't sell. So CEPI was set up in order to take vaccines through the phase where they can be put into stockpiles and used and tested in appropriate situations and outbreaks. And they were preparing for something called disease X and COVID-19 actually fit the bill perfectly. So very shortly after, the disease was announced and the first descriptions of the virus were made, CEPI put out a call for proposals and immediately four companies, within two weeks, four companies had contracts to move forward with vaccines that would be in human trials within four months. Again, kind of unprecedented speed. Um, and so we have a lot um, to thank for, for the of countries and, and donor organizations that put together CEPI. But the other important thing is CEPI is a cooperative body. And it built into the agreements that they make with companies are um, conditions for global access. And clearly those will get more and more detailed as we get closer and closer to vaccines that work. But, but global participation, so again, emphasizing the idea that we all are in this together, global collaboration, global support for organizations like CEPI that help to develop these vaccines that everyone should use, um, I think is a really critical part. And, and you know, we really need to think about how we put together support packages for organizations that are really doing something that will benefit us all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim. We have had so many questions in, hundreds really, from all over the world while, while we've been talking in this discussion. I really want to thank everyone who's contributed questions, many more than we could ever actually use in the time available. But I want to turn to this one before I return to all of our six contributors for their final thoughts. Uh, and it's this question, Dr. Mweti, which I want to put uh, to you. It comes from Dr. Mwenya Kasonde, who's in Zambia. The impact of this pandemic will be very different for men and women. Not only are men noted to have a higher mortality rate from COVID-19, but women will have a much higher exposure to the coronavirus as they make up 70 percent of the global health workforce and in other ways they will be more at risk. Is enough emphasis being placed on COVID-19 and gender? Um, yes, I, I think we are catching up with the fact that there will be gender differences in how people are affected by the COVID-19 uh, 
uh, COVID-19 pandemic and starting to work with, uh, again, I'll refer to our partners in the UN and some of the, the organizations, particularly the women's organizations uh, that are concerned about this so that we place the correct emphasis on this and that the strategies that are being implemented in countries take into account that men and women will be affected differently and particularly that women will likely be much more exposed because of their caring roles, not only as healthcare workers, but as, as care providers in families as well. So if somebody is ill in the family, it's very likely to be a woman who is called upon to care for them. This is something that we're working to integrate into the strategies that uh, governments are, are developing. And I'd like to hear very much encourage those groups that are involved in issues to do with gender equity and specificities of gender around development to engage themselves as well, to mobilize their members so that they play a role. And it's not only the governments and the experts from international organizations, but that this emerges at the community level. This emerges from the grassroots because they've, we've seen that they can have a really powerful impact and can supplement some of the capacities that governments are putting in place. So thank you, that's a very good question. Thank you. And Dr. Al Mandari, we, we haven't really talked about treatments and obviously, you know, there, there is no accepted treatment or, or, or certainly cure for COVID-19. But there is a lot of talk about using existing drugs or whether things like the BCG vaccine might protect uh, people to some extent. What would you like uh, to, to say about um, treatments or the, or the use of existing drugs on this? Uh, thank you. In fact, WHO through it is experts you know, have been following what is uh, shared in the news for the last few weeks about uh, the introduction or the use of some of well-known medications like chloroquine and some other antiviral medications on patients from different countries. And also it has been followed through it is expertise, you know, uh, the use of uh, plasma in some uh, countries as well. Uh, based on these uh, sort of experiences, uh, uh, some have shown positive impact on those sick patients who came out uh, in a very safe manner. But still, uh, WHO is is not uh, yet, you know, uh, uh, sort of announced a very specific medication that can be used to treat COVID-19. Uh, and, um, you know, collection of data analysis and review of these uh, trials on different countries is undergoing. And hopefully, you know, soon we will be able to uh, give the right advice on any specific medication that can be used safely. Thank you so much. So we we have five minutes left, and I want to turn to each of the each of you and just ask you for a very brief, a final thought on where you think we will be on the pandemic. Uh, in six months time, either in your country, in your region or relating to your area of expertise. So just a brief final thought uh, from each of you. Dr. Almari, what do you think? Oh, I think we'll come back to you, Dr. Almari, because we need to, your microphone is um, is muted, I think. Can you unmute it? OK, we'll come we'll come back to you in just a moment. Rosella Micio, where do you think uh, we will be in six months time in Italy? Well, um, I don't know, but uh, I mean, I, I think that uh, we shall be more prepared, at least um, for, for Italy. But what I hope is really that uh, this uh, solidarity that is uh, developing very fast, uh, very rapidly in Italy will stay also uh, in six months and then in the in the new normal and will also include uh, uh, really the world globally. Uh, so not just uh, not just Italy, but uh, we really need to think about ourselves as one community, as David Navarro was saying, one family. Thank you. Dr. Wang, your thought? I would like to take this opportunity to speak up for global nurses and nurses comprise over half of the healthcare workforce worldwide. Mm -hmm. And apart from our numbers, we already have the mindset and the professional training necessary to control and ultimately defeat COVID-19. And year 2020 is the WHO International Year of the Nurse and midwife. 
The efforts of contributions of nurses in combating COVID-19 should be recognized broadly and at the highest level of society. I firmly believe that we will win the battle against this unseen enemy by adhering to the spirit and substance of ICN International Council of Nurses, President Annette Kennedy's watchword together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Almari? It's really a very difficult question to say our thoughts for something that's really in future. However, we are always optimistic. But I need to say that it's too early to say anything now, but I think we need actually to be uh, prepared. And also we need actually to make sure that business continuity is something that is essential because life has really to carry on. So, and again, I think we need to unite uh, at international level and globally to combat not only the COVID-19, but also other re-emerging diseases that yet to come. Thank you. Dr. Jerome Kim. So I think uh, the one of the keys that, that I've been taking away from this is we really need to do research. We need to do research urgently, ethically, and, and with an eye to both if we really want to reduce the suffering and death that's occurring from COVID-19 and also eventually to develop a vaccine to prevent the infection. But I think the emphasis on, on global efforts, and this not only extends to the sharing of information, the sharing of data, but as countries are emerging from their own COVID-19 crises, we have to look around the world to see what other countries are, are suffering and what the gaps are in care, uh, surveillance, um, treatment in those countries and why. Because I think that as long as we have COVID epidemics raging in parts of the world that are unchecked, then all of us, all the countries in the world, remain at risk for reintroduction of the disease. So really, this is a global response to a global pathogen. And unless we really can get together and control it together, then the pathogen will continue to threaten countries around the world. Thank you. Dr. Moeti? Uh, yes, a tough, challenging and interesting question. Um, first of all, I, I have to acknowledge, I think there will have been a lot of suffering in African countries as we see the numbers of cases increasing and the level of preparedness of the healthcare systems. This is a reality. But secondly, I think we will have been able to learn very much from the experience of a range of countries across the world and be taking on board those to apply in a very challenging context of African countries. And I just like to echo what Dr. Jerome said. I'm optimistic by nature and I think we will see a much stronger global solidarity emerging around many issues, including ensuring that those countries without the industrial capacity to produce uh, critical items uh, are able to import them in countries. I see this emerging. So, what I hope to see in African countries is by six months from now, uh, hopefully we'll have peaked in a number of countries, we'll be applying the lessons from many countries and we will have very much strengthened the capacity to face up to this pandemic and learn for the future to invest in the healthcare systems in peacetime when we don't have a pandemic or an epidemic. Thank you. And uh, lastly, Dr. Almandari. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And, uh, you know, before I give my uh, answer to your question, I would like to express, you know, our sincere thanks and gratitude to all healthcare workers around the globe. You know, last uh, last week we, we have been celebrating the World Health Day and, uh, uh, you know, as uh, mentioned by uh, uh, um, Wang, you know, it is the year of nursing and midwives and they are our heroes. They are uh, our frontliners and they are in the fire and facing the fire, saving lives. So uh, God bless them and we are with them all the time. Uh, answering your question, as my colleagues mentioned, you know, this is a new virus. It is a new pandemic. We don't have the full picture about it. And uh, still, you know, day by day, we are learning about the dynamics of this virus. But uh, at the same time, as my colleagues also mentioned, we have to be optimistic. Uh, optimistic if, you know, uh, countries um, sort of followed one concept and uh, one approach that have been recommended by all scientific bodies, you know, including WHO. The approach of one, uh, one, I mean, the whole government with it is different sectors, governmental and non-governmental sectors. Uh, the approach and the concept of uh, the whole society, you know, at different levels. 
and also both uh, government and societies are working close hand to hand to, hand to face this pandemic. And I'm sure, inshallah, in, uh, if these measures are, are followed, we will be able to uh, turn the curve down and uh, to control the, the pandemic, inshallah. Thank you. Well, let me thank all of you for your contributions over the last 90 minutes. Dr. Ahmed Al Mandari, Dr. Uh, the WHO's Regional Director for Eastern Mediterranean, Dr. Matshi Diso Moeti, Regional Director for Africa for WHO, Dr. Sali Al Mari, Assistant Minister for Health Affairs uh, of Qatar, Rosella Michio, President of the NGO Emergency, Dr. Jerome Kim. Director General of the International Vaccine Institute and Dr. Siu Hong Wang from the Taiwan Nurses Association. And thank you to everyone who contributed uh, questions and comments and thoughts online. Thank you. And I wish we had been able to use more of them, but there were just so many. And um, to everyone who watched, thank you for joining us. And this event will be posted on Qatar Foundation's YouTube page. You'll be able to find it by searching there for Education City Speaker Series, Flattening the Curve, Global Responses to COVID-19. Thank you all. Goodbye.